I've watched many hours of your videos, but I don't think I've ever heard you describe yourself on the big five model. Can, care to tell us how you rank on each trade? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a problem because I know the tests, and so it's hard for me to take them without being... Well, because I know the tests, right? So it's hard for me to take them without the, the ever-present threat of conscious manipulation. Um, I've gone through them with my family, you know, to, to see if we could get a more accurate... Um, accurate judgment so i can tell you on the big 10 scale which is the understand myself personality scale i'm pretty enthusiastic i think it's 75th 80th percentile something like that um, 99th percentile for assertiveness so i'm pretty extroverted because those two together make extroversion and then with neuroticism that's a hard one because I've had this problem with chronic depression that looks like it's autoimmune related and so I felt a lot more negative emotion than the typical person does I would say by a substantial margin. Um, withdrawal, well I don't seem to shy away from things. So you know apart from the fact that I do feel anticipatory anxiety which I think is secondary to this depression let's say, I don't seem to shy away from things. So. I don't think that temperamentally I'm particularly high in withdrawal. I am more, um, it's not irritable, what's the, what's the next one? Volatile. I'm higher in volatility than withdrawal by a substantial margin. I, I can be quite irritable, but again, it's hard to dissociate that from the depression. So anyways, my levels of negative emotion are higher than I would prefer. Um, Agreeableness, I'm pretty compassionate, pretty high in compassion. It's like 75, 80th percentile. So, um, you know, and but I'm I'm relatively low in politeness. So I think, but not, you know, not fifth percentile, something like 30th percentile, 40th percentile, if I remember correctly. So um, that means that, ha, huh, it means that I'm blunt enough to hurt people's feelings now and then and that I really don't like that because the compassion thing gets me. So, um, conscientiousness, I'm moderately orderly, 70, 75th percentile, and like 99th percentile for industriousness. And then openness, both of them, intellect and 99th percentile for intellect, and then it's like 95th, something like that, for openness or higher. Um, so that's where, I, that's where I rank. So... My wife and I found out earlier in the year we may not be able to have children. Then last month I was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, man, how do I combat depression? Well, the first thing that we should point out here, I'm very sorry to hear about all that. That's, that's a lot of tragedy in a very short period of time, man. Um, and I'm not going to give you any casual advice because, but I, maybe I can make some things clearer. The first is you're not depressed you've had terrible things happen to you. That's not the same thing, right? I distinguish between them. If a client comes to me and they say they're feeling very sad and down and, and anxious and worried about everything and so forth, then I kind of walk through their life. Do they have friends? Do they have a family? Do they have a meaningful job? Is their educational background appropriate for their level of intelligence and ability? Are they taking care of themselves? Do they have something to look forward to? Do they use their time outside of work productively and wisely, etc. So you think about those as the dimensions of a good life. There's more, or maybe there's fewer, but that's not too bad for a, for a quick and dirty first pass through, let's say. Um, those are the dimensions, by the way, that you work on if you do the future authoring program in the self-authoring suite. You're asked to think about all those dimensions and consider what your life might be like if you optimized along all of them. And so... Um, If, you, if all of those things are going well for you and you feel terrible all the time, then you're depressed. Because there's, there's something wrong with your emotional regulation. You know, I mean, maybe you're having an existential crisis. That's a possibility. But I mean, let's assume we can't see anything structurally wrong with your life, but you're feeling terrible. Then I would say, well, you have depression. There's something wrong. Maybe it's physiological. And people like that, in my experience, those are the people who often really benefit from antidepressants. But then there's the other sort of person who, who is in trouble. You know, they, they, 
their educational attainment is not what it should be. They don't have a job. They have an alcohol or drug problem. They have a family that's really not functioning well or they don't have a family. Their immediate relationship, intimate relationship is non-existent or terrible. Um, their friends are non-existent or, or, or worthless and, and destructive. Um, they don't get along with their relatives. They're in poor mental and physical health. You get the picture. That's and they're not feeling good. Their their, their mood's low and they're anxious. That's not depression, like it might be, you know. But it's a terrible. But what that is is a terrible life, and and those are different things. They needed to be. They need to be conceptualized differently. Now, even if you have a terrible life, an antidepressant might be able to lift you up enough so that you can keep fighting. Let's say, assuming that that's what you're doing. But an antidepressant obviously isn't going to help isn't going to remove the facts of your terrible life. Now, you, you've got terrible things happening to you at the moment. And, and there's no simple answer to that. I would say you could, you could take a look at chapter 12 in my book, 12 Rules for Life. It's, it's called uh, Pet a Cat When You Encounter One on the Street. And in part, it's a it's an autobiographical chapter about how my wife and I and my family, my, my son and daughter and my, my extended family as well, dealt with my daughter's extremely serious illness. Well, she, it's still, it still plagues her to some degree, although not nearly as much as it did. She was very seriously ill when she was a teenager. And uh, it was an ongoing crisis, uh, continual for years of crisis. And... So the question is, how do you cope with that? And the answer is, the first answer is, you shrink your time frame, you know. You've had these, especially with regards to your diagnosis, it's like, all of a sudden your future has been thrown completely into chaos. And you don't know how to deal with that, and, and who would? You do what you can to stabilize your medical treatment and to optimize your quality of life while that's happening. A very complicated thing to do. And then I would say you live for the day, you know, for the week maybe. Maybe a week's too much even, but for the day. It's like you get up in the morning, you think, I need to do everything I can to make this day as meaningful and and rich as I possibly can. And... Hopefully, I will have had a full day by this evening, and then I'll be able to sleep. And then I'll be able to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to try to make this day as useful and meaningful and engaging as it can be. And then maybe when you're really sick, you don't have a day, you have hours. And then you do the same thing for the hours, and then maybe you do the same thing with the minutes. I would also say, you know, you've been through a lot of shock and it's conceivable that you might need to talk to someone. It's also conceivable that an antidepressant could help you. You know, you've got a lot to deal with and you might need, your nervous system might need some stabilization with all that stress. And so that's something to consider. Antidepressants are also quite effective as pain medications, especially a drug called Cymbalta. So that's also worth knowing because you need to know about effective pain medication. It's very important. Um, in extreme situations of pain, opiates, of course, are the drug of choice, but you can use drugs like methylphenidate, the Ritalin, the ADHD drug. You can use them as adjuncts to, to pain medication. And people need to know that because the, the, um, they're basically amphetamines. Amphetamines have analgesic properties, but they also keep they, they also maintain alertness. And so the problem with opiates is they can be sedating, but an opiate amphetamine combination, and this is for people who are in absolutely intractable pain, by the way, um, that can increase alertness and help cope with pain. And it's really useful to know what you might need to cope with pain. So I would say shrink your time horizon and then Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Tim. 
shrink your time horizon and then concentrate on the concentrate on the moment whatever that moment happens to be it might be the next minute you know i don't know what else to do when you're in an extreme situation the other thing i guess the final thing i would say with regards to the we may not ha be able to have children well you need a plan to address that to the best that that you can to the best way that you can and then you have to give yourself some time to reconceptualize your life and your future and i would say news like we may not be able to have children that probably takes about a year or a year and a half to digest so don't be too hard on yourself if you haven't figured it out yet it's any major life transformation like a really major life transformation i would say takes a minimum of a year to really adapt to